All right, everybody, come on in, find a place, and uh, we'll get started with our service this evening. Looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us tonight. Thank you for being here on Saturday evening and uh, being in church on Saturday night. All right. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will sing. I who made the stars of night, I will make the darkness bright. Shabbat 
Thank you, Joseph. That was great. All right, get your Bibles out. Brother Miller is going to come and preach to us once again. And uh, Brother Miller, you come and open the Word of God for us. Thank you. Take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And uh, we've been looking at Acts chapter 1 throughout the week, and I'm thankful for that. Acts chapter 1. As you find there, you can find verse 4. Then let me mention, if I could, just a couple of items on the tables uh, there that could be a help to you. Let me encourage you, if you haven't visited uh, the missionaries' displays, please do so. And now that the Mullins are in, you'll be able to uh, visit theirs as well and uh, get their cards and pray for them. Unfortunately, we ran out of prayer cards ourselves. This is terrible. Uh, so we'll have to connect in some other way. Uh, perhaps uh, email newsletter or whatever, if, if you're interested in that, you can ask us about that. Uh, but uh, we do have uh, some materials that could help in uh, soul winning and evangelism, in uh, personal revival, Christian walk, family, several things that can be a help to you. I mentioned the DVD, Will I See You in Heaven? Uh, those are available. Those packets are available. Uh, but I'd like to mention tonight and highlight a book called Cowboy Boots in Darkest Africa, and I see a couple nodding their heads. How many here, have, have any read this book before? Okay, well, okay, there's a handful. Uh, this is Bill Rice II's account of going to Africa. Uh, now, he was the one who started the Bill Rice Ranch ministry in 1953. Talking about steps of faith, they had, uh, they were going to go for about three to six months, be gone to Africa, and to help a missionary there, uh, one other missionary that he actually helped, Carl Becker, med medical doctor, perhaps you're familiar with that name, uh, but he was going to help uh, different ones in the Congo, right in the bush. Uh, anyway, so they had uh, a sum of money saved up for his wife to live on. You see, when an evangelist goes on a missions trip, um, he has no other source of income, and so he needed to do that because there was no offerings being taken, and and so they had that to live on, and then they came up with uh, the Bill Rice Ranch and uh, several other things, and it ended up where they took all of those funds and they just put it right in the ministry. They had to put that in there. They got, they got 1,300 acres for, are you ready for this, $20 an acre. Wouldn't you like to have done the same thing? <laughs> that was 1950. Well, they had nothing for her to live on. And for months, just by faith, God provided. But the stories that you will read in this book of Bill Rice and what he faced are like a fiction book tacked by Latuka Spearman. Um, so many things. Uh, the story of the leopard attacking is not only a hilarious uh, but as well, is absolutely just, uh, just compelling. God provided for them safety and provision. Um, just so many, so many stories. Uh, one story I'm going to share tomorrow in my message in the morning service. Uh, but uh, they would go out and uh, for uh, weeks they'd be gone from whatever home base and they would just take their guns and they would hunt their food. And uh, they would go to villages and unreached people groups in the bush and uh, just present the gospel. Incredible. Uh, one particular time uh, as he did so, uh, he was fighting malaria and uh, just incredible things. Uh, but I wish I could sit, s tell so much more. Any book you get from Bill Rice the Second is incredibly easy to read and hard to put down. Uh, they're just compelling stories. But it'll challenge you, whether or not you're a missionary or called as a missionary, it'll challenge you where you are to serve the Lord faithfully and to trust him to be able to see what he can do. Uh, his books, we have actually a bundle of his books uh, there. There's one called Brother Super, a great Dane dog that they had, uh, Thrilling Western Stories. There's two volumes in there. Also, Noel, the loving lion. They actually had an African lion cub in Tennessee. It was a different day, folks. And uh, so, uh, but there's a bundle of books there, and if you'd like to get the entire bundle, then you get one book free. It's, uh, it's a savings of $7. But uh, I encourage you, though, think about that one, Cowboy Boots in Darkest Africa. You have Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1. 
Look, if you would, at uh, verse 4. We will remain seated as we read here, and then uh, just a moment we'll pray. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. The Bible says this, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. The promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. So here, he says there's going to be a promise, okay? And the promise is the promise of the Father, that the Holy Ghost is going, you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Um, what is going to take place with these believers at Pentecost? It is what's taken place with every single believer since. Uh, think of it this way. If you take a sponge and you take that sponge and you place it into a bucket or a pail of water, it is now immersed in that water. Not only is the sponge immersed in the water, what happens to the sponge? The water in that bucket goes into the sponge. When we are baptized with the Holy Ghost, it is, he is placing us in Christ. We're in Christ. But not only are we in Christ, but the Holy Spirit comes and he moves inside of us. He is in us. The Holy Spirit in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Well, this takes place. And uh, he says, here's the promise. But with this promise is going to come something else. Not just the person of the Holy Spirit, which is fantastic. But his powerful provision for what? Look at verse 8. But ye shall receive that's an important word we'll get to it in a, a little bit later but ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses receiving power by the holy ghost to be witnesses both in jerusalem and all judea and in samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth to the ends of the globe matthew chapter 28 he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, as he says, sends us in teaching, he says, and, go, uh, and I am with you uh, unto the end of the world. That is the end of the age. So we have power promised of God to go to the end of the age, end of the generation, to the ends of the globes of the, of the earth, to be able to give the gospel God's provision and his power is available his plan is for worldwide evangelism and how did it start with the new testament church here the first century church it started remember by a prayer meeting so they had a prayer meeting where they got together for 10 days they're in the upper room what elements were in that prayer meeting obviously there were people we went through the people the prayer meeting they messed up but they got God's mercy. We saw the plan of the prayer meeting. God's plan is to initiate revival that would then empower the church to be able to win the world. And this is now the promise. The third element in this prayer meeting is the promise. Folks, we have every single element that they had in that first prayer meeting right here. We have people that have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Perfect? No. But can get, get God's mercy and by His grace now live abundant lives. Not only that, we have God's plan. God's plan of Pentecost, that was just first fruits, a sample of more to come. The Spirit of God, when He came at Pentecost, did not leave. He came to stay. He is the same Spirit of God here right now. And now we have the promise. The promise. But it says in verse 8, but ye shall receive power. Receive power. Look, if you would, at chapter 2 and verse uh, 1. After what, what took place there after their prayer meeting, uh, verse 1 says this, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues, already spoken languages, as a spirit gave them utterance to be able to speak. What is taking place? They received the gift and the power of the Holy Ghost. Verse 
38 and 39. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Would you see that? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39. For the promise is unto you, that's speaking to the Jews there, and to your children, the Jewish descendants. But look at this. And to all that are far off, that is you and me, every believer in every country, even as many as our Lord God shall call. We have the same promise that they had. Have you received the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight to be able to receive your power by faith. Lord, I pray that you would bind Satan from this place and his lies and his distractions, his discouragement, his deception. And Lord, I pray that the truth would be known. Help us to simply by faith take the promise and to be able to realize we have the power of the Holy Spirit right now available to us. Lord, would you do your work right now? Lord, I take the anointing of the Holy Spirit for preaching right now. I ask all your blessings upon this service. Would you pour your spirit out? In Jesus' name, amen. I remember witnessing to a man uh, across the street from the church we're having a conference at, and I was burdened for him because I saw him every morning. He'd come out and he'd sit on his porch. And I thought, you know, I need to go witness to him. And so I walked across the street. I got in conversation. And I said, hey, uh, we're at a, having a conference at the church right over here. And uh, I'd like to invite you to come. Would you think about coming? Nope. I said, okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, more important than coming to church is knowing for sure that you're on your way to heaven. Do you know that you're on your way to heaven? <clears throat> and he said, yeah. I said, well, how do you know that? I said, uh, he said, well, I've got my own way. And then he started to explain. And I think, folks, he had his own way. I don't think I've ever heard anything like that. A little bit of uh, 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 traditions, uh, a little bit of Catholicism, charismatic movement, uh, Islam. I mean, you name it. He just put it in there. And it was just incredible. And it, well, the truth is, anything that is not by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ, everything else is works. And it was all a works uh, mentality and religion. And uh, I started to witness to him. From my human perspective, with little or no effectiveness at all. Before long, I found myself walking across the street back to the church, asking the question, where's my power? Not my power of myself, but the power promised of the Father through the Holy Spirit. Still the same week I was preaching and the church had a Christian school. It was open enrollment. So there's a student from a, a church that did not teach and preach Jesus Christ, salvation by faith uh, through grace and through Jesus Christ. And uh, so he was there and afterwards he uh, had some questions for me. I thought, good, he wants to know how to be saved. No, he wanted to debate. It went from a level of a debate to an argument. I was frustrated. He was frustrated. We're both going at it. And I left the conversation with him no closer to knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. And again, asking the question, where is my power? Power promised of the Holy, Holy Ghost, uh, of the, the Father, to be able to be a, an effective witness for him. Still the same week, I preached on the matter of hell. Do you realize Jesus preached on hell? Very clearly he did. And I preached on hell. And a lady afterwards would have none of it. She said, I don't believe a loving God would send someone to hell. And uh, she immediately, um, uh, after some sharp words, and I'm trying to explain to her some things, a loving God, showing her a way of escape, she would have none of it. She just left the, the place there and the, the church. And again, having no effectiveness, I said, where is my power? It says, ye shall receive power. Now, whenever we think of this, we think of the New Testament church, the day of Pentecost was just going to come, right? No matter what they did. It was promised. It was already scheduled on God's timetable. And uh, they were going to do it and get it. So they just had to sit there like um, 
jellyfish doing nothing, just kind of floating with whatever current was going along. No. When it says in Acts 1, verse 8, but ye shall receive power, the word is take. When it says in verse 38, chapter 2, 38, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, it is the word, it means to take. When it talks about these times of receiving, just like the Holy, Jesus received the Holy Ghost, and then he shed forth this in chapter 2 and verse 33, it's the same word, take. Now, if we said tonight, uh, for someone that needed to receive Jesus Christ as Savior, it's just like receiving a what? Gift. Okay, if I had a gift up here and I said, okay, uh, this is the gift. Uh, would you take the gift? And I offered the gift to somebody, and then we go through that scenario with explaining that to someone that needs to trust Christ. They could have the gift here, but unless they take it by receiving, receiving it by taking it, they would not benefit from that gift. Folks, there is a step of faith for these people. There is a response, and there is a response for us. If we are going to see the power of the Holy Spirit to win this world through missions and our local communities, we must receive the power of the Holy Ghost. Take it by faith. Now, again, when you trust Jesus Christ as Savior, you are placed into Christ. You are in his position. You are justified, declared righteous before the Heavenly Father. And the Holy Spirit then moves inside of you, just like that sponge plunged into the water. You're in Christ, but the Holy Spirit is inside of you, Christ in you as well. So you received at salvation all of the Holy Spirit. You don't receive more of the Holy Spirit later. You don't have to speak in uh, a gibberish called uh, what charismatics would say would be tongues. And then, then you have your full salvation. No, no, you have full salvation as far as eternal life. The Holy Spirit, he's a seal of your salvation right now. But are you experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit who is already fully inside of you to be an effective witness? What is this power meaning? What does it have to do with? You know, instead of going out with doubt and dread, full of doubt, shouldn't we go out witnessing full of faith? Instead of going out grudgingly because we're required, shouldn't there be a delight and an eagerness? Instead of going out with fear, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Then where's that spirit coming from? But of power. He's given you the, the, the spirit of power. He, the Holy Spirit, is the spirit of power. How about not going out just to be faithful? You know, it's good to be faithful, but folks, we get in this trap thinking, well, I just go out and I'm faithful. I just knock on doors. I'm going to go knock on doors. Let's go knock on doors. Like it's some spiritual thing to knock on a door. You go to a knock on the door and you, someone comes to the door, can I help you? No, I just need to knock on your door. Thank you very much. I'm a Baptist. I knock on doors. That's what I do. Yeah, we'll see you. Okay. All right. And uh, we're we just faithful to do that. Well, when we get into that, oh, we're just going to be faithful. We're just the remnant. Oh, we're just poor little old us. You know, we're Baptists. We don't smoke and chew and drink, and we don't go with those that do, and the only thing we have left is food. That's what we had tonight, lots of good food. We, do, you, do you realize all the international food we had tonight? We had Mexican, uh, we had Chinese, we had Japanese sushi, I was thankful for that. Uh, we, had, uh, um, we had another country represented, Kentucky, it was Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, so... Several things here, you know. <laughs> so, all these things. When we come to the matter of going, we don't have to go with, well, it's not going to do any good, but I'm just going to be faithful anyway. No. We have a promise of the Father 
to have powerful, effective witness. What does that mean? Three specific areas. Anointing for understanding. A boldness to speak. And number three, an effectiveness by the Holy Spirit to convince the listener. Number one, there's going to be an understanding. Now, what, is, what did they do? There was a response. They had to receive. What did we see them doing? Of course, we see the promise given. Wait for the Father. The promise is going to come. You're going to receive the Holy Ghost. You'll be witnesses then. So look in chapter 1, verse 14, just to refresh our memory. 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Now, you know, it tells us who is at the prayer meeting, but it doesn't tell us what they asked for. What do you think they asked for? Well, what do you think they asked for? Um, do you think they, let's get together because uh, we need to pray for um, all the, uh, uh, the you know, soreness uh, and all the physical illness. No, 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 no. No, what did they ask for? Okay, let's illustrate it this way. Let's imagine we go uh, to um, a fast food place sometime this week. And I go first. I'm actually inside the fast food restaurant. Let's say Chick-fil-A, my favorite one. Okay, so I go into Chick-fil-A, and I order the char-grilled chicken sandwich deluxe with the gluten-free bun. I'm a hippie. And uh, um, maybe waffle fries if I'm splurging. And uh, unsweet tea because I can't have the sweet anymore. And uh, so I get the grilled chicken, gluten-free bun, waffle fries, and an unsweet tea. And I take it back to my table. Now, the whole time, you've been out on the outside looking in. And as you're looking in, you see me talking to the, the um, person at the counter. And then you see me get my tray of food. And then you see me sit down. And you come to my table afterwards. You know, you couldn't hear what I said, but you saw the people involved in the conversation. And you saw what I received. And then you sit down at the table and you say, Brother Miller, when you were up there at the counter talking to that worker, what did you say? I said, well, uh, hello, and, and then I gave my order. Well, what did you ask for in your order? And I looked down at my tray, and I looked up at you, and I say, um, char-grilled chicken sandwich, deluxe, gluten-free bun. <laughs> Waffle fries and unsweet tea. No, no, no. But when you were up there, what did you say to that worker? What did you ask for from the bottom and the depths of your most inner being? I asked for a char-grilled chicken sandwich, gluten-free bun, fries, and a drink. You know what I asked for is what I received. Folks. It doesn't tell us what they asked for because it shows us what they received in chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all accord with one place. And then in verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And then later in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, it explains this is the promise from Joel. That the promise of the Holy Spirit coming and being outpoured. They received what they asked for. What we need is an anointing. You know, someone else asked for the Holy Spirit as well. Look, if you would, at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 3, we see the Lord Jesus. Luke chapter 3. Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. In Luke 3, verse 21. Luke 3, verse 21. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Now when all the people were baptized, um, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized, and what does it say? Praying. The heaven was opened. What was Jesus praying about? Well, what happened next? Verse 22. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. The voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in, who, in thee 
I am well pleased. Jesus, being already filled with the Holy Spirit to be able to be a holy example for us, not having one sin whatsoever, just coming through uh, all, all of this. And as he comes up being baptized, he's praying, he's asking. And then for what? For the Holy Ghost to come and be poured out upon him in power to minister to others. And then what do we see him doing in chapter 4? We see the temptation going into uh, the wilderness. And when chapter 4 and verse 14, look at chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Here he is returning in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, as he comes in uh, and he reads from Isaiah, uh, look at what it says. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The idea of this anointing is God has illumined him. God has come upon him to be able to enable him and have understanding as a speaker and then to enable and help the listener to get it. You know what? We need the Holy Spirit whenever we speak. Here, it's, I love this because it says, He hath anointed me to preach the gospel. Now, there's two di- different words in the New Testament. We get the word preach. Uh, one is uh, uh, caruso, but that's not this one. This one is the word uangalizo. You say, what in the world is that? It's the word evangelize. He's going to preach the gospel. He's going to give out the gospel, the good news of salvation. And he needs the Holy Spirit to come to help with understanding and illumination. I remember speaking to a man in uh, Middle Tennessee area, and uh, we were at a church, and uh, as we were speaking after the service, he, I met him in a Sunday school room, and, and we're talking, and we're trying to give him the gospel plan, and he was all messed up with works and all kinds of different things, but every single statement he wasn't getting. It was like everything was difficult. Every truth I would present, he wasn't understanding it, and it just, I was just getting bogged down. I don't know if I prayed. I don't remember. It's been years ago what exactly took place. But somewhere in the conversation, all of a sudden, it was, I mean, just as instant as flipping on a light switch, he got it. He goes, oh, I get it now. I understand. You know what? Satan uh, blinds, the God of this world has blinded their eyes to Keep them in darkness so they can't see the truth. What we need is an anointing whenever we speak to others to have an understanding so they can get it. Uh, I remember yet another lady. She was a Catholic, and uh, she was in uh, middle Pennsylvania. She has never left the area. And uh, she came to one of our revival services, and uh, she's never been out of the state. And I I gave an invitation. I said, how many has has never uh, trusted Christ? Don't know for sure. They're on their way to heaven. She raised her hand. She came back the second night. I said, how many has not re- trusted Christ, not know for sure they're on the way to heaven? She raised her hand. Still didn't come to the invitation. Third night, she came back, raised her hand again. I said to her, I said, Miss Rose, can I talk with you? She said, yes. I said, uh, and so another lady and myself talked with her, and we went through the gospel plan, but she wasn't getting it. She understood that about sin, about the penalty of sin, about Jesus dying on the cross and was buried and rose again. But she said, but you also have to be a good person. I said, no, look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. She didn't see it. I showed her Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. She did not see it. I showed her yet another verse on works and her own righteousness, and she didn't see it. They're all filthy rags. She didn't get it. Then I thought of Romans 4, 5. It was the Spirit that gave that verse. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I said, notice it says, to him that worketh a lot, no. To him that worketh some, no. To him that worketh a little, no. To him that worketh not. 
And it says his faith is counted for righteousness. I said, Miss Rose, if I come over to your house, it was fall time, and if I rake your leaves in your yard, and she said, oh, that would be so nice. I said, that's not the point. <laughs> I rake your leaves, and uh, then I also clear your sidewalk, and I clear your drive. And then when I'm finished, I take the rake, and I put it on the side of the house, and I leave. Would you come out a few minutes after I left and grab that rake and begin raking the yard that has no leaves on it? She says, no. Would you rake and clear the drive or the sidewalk that has no leaves on it? She giggled and said, no. I said, why not? She said, because the work's already done. And she saw it. It was the Holy Spirit doing that, not me. God will give you the words or the illustration to be able to help that person in understanding. There is still a man I just spent two hours speaking with on Tuesday of this week. He's a Catholic gentleman, a, a doctor. And he just said at the end, no, it's got to be good works. You've got to live a Christian life. I've met him. I've spoken with him a number of times. I need the Holy Spirit's power and his effectiveness in helping that man in understanding and peeling away those blinders. There's an anointing for understanding. Number two, when the power of the Holy Spirit comes, he gives you a boldness to speak. Look, if you would, back in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We see this boldness throughout the, the book of Acts as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, of course, in uh, as you're turning to Acts 4, we saw at the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak. That's a key thing. Boldness to speak. Filled with power to be able to be bold to speak. Look at Acts chapter 4. Find, if you would, um, uh, let's go all the way down to uh, verse 29. Acts 4, 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with what? Boldness. Verse 33, and great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Here is the power of the Holy Spirit to be bold, to do what? To open our mouth, to actually speak, to give the gospel ourselves, to say, okay, I know the missionaries need to do this, but I need to do this. I need to give the gospel. I need to be bold. Do we need to pray for this? Yes. In fact, would you pray for this for others? Would you turn to Ephesians 6 if you can? Ephesians chapter 6. Notice in verse 18. At the end of the, the spiritual armor, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, Ephesians 6, 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Verse 19, ready? And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly. I underline that phrase. Open my mouth boldly. You know what? You got to pray that for your missionaries open, that they'd have a door of utterance, that they'd be able to speak, a door would be open, opportunity would be wide open, and they would speak that word. Let me ask, can I ask this, would it be okay, uh, all the, the men uh, that are here called to missions, um, whether you're on the field yet or not, would you mind, if you're able, would you be able to stand for just a moment? Would you be able to stand? All the the men here, just the men represented, if you would. Wow, okay. Brother Parak, Parak, I'm sorry, Parak. <laughs> you know, I prayed for you today, and I said, God, you placed that unreached people group on his heart 
Now, would you send him and give him support and get him there and give him a door of utterance? Thank you. You can be seated. Brother, I didn't know that you were called the missions, Brother David. <laughs> God bless you. May I, I'll pray for you as well. Would you be seated? Thank you so much. Brother Yoder, I prayed for you. I don't know what all the ministries that you would have, but I know you have trips coming up. I prayed for uh, Uganda and uh, for uh, some others as well. I prayed for you for a door of utterance on those specific trips. I, I did pray for you today. You can be seated. Thank you. Brother Mullins, we just met today a few moments before supper, and I'm thankful for your faithful ministry. And I pray not only for your physical condition, but I did pray that the Lord would keep the door open, that you'd have a door of utterance. Thank you so much. God bless you. Clarence, is that right? Lawrence. Lawrence. I thought it was clear, <laughs> close. <laughs> Lawrence. Not only did I pray that you'd be able to continue to barbecue hamburgers and hot dogs, <laughs> but the Lord would give you opportunity with the, your, your burden for children in the orphanage and the boys' home. May, may God bless you. I prayed specifically for you, Brother Callahan, for boldness as you speak to those soldiers. And I know oftentimes, especially if you're talking to ones of rank, it can be intimidating, very the Spirit of God who has come over you and give you boldness. May God bless you. Brother Fitzsimmons, I prayed for you in a great way today. That in all the places that you're going to go, that the door of utterance would be there and the Spirit would come upon you just like you preached to us on Thursday night. I believe God's got his hand upon him, and you can see a love in his heart, but it's not his love, it's God's love through him. And I'm praying for you, and I will continue to pray, but I did pray for you, brother. Thank you. Would you do the same? Would you pray for these men and others that you support, their wives, their families? But would you pray this? For yourself. God, give me that boldness. We have a, an outreach to New York City. It's in the subway system to New York City. We've been going ever since 9-11. We went the first year with probably 12 or 13 uh, people. We were unorganized. We just had a burden to reach people. We took DVDs. We took tracks, and we witnessed and just, just saw a few people saved got organized and we spread the word about our burden to go to be a help to New York City and uh, we had uh, 20 come and then 30 come and then 40 and now we average about 50 every year in January they go to New York City <laughs> we go and we're in the subway so it's still cold but we're out of the elements and uh, it's just like a sidewalk it's a public thoroughfare and we're allowed to do this we give out the gospel and it can be very intimidating not everybody in New York City is pleasant I don't know if you knew that <laughs> it's very intimidating I remember a big man Jorge construction worker still had the dust from the concrete and the, the sawdust on him as he stopped by and he asked for prayer. We'd set up what's called a prayer station. We'd pray with people and then we'd give them the gospel. And I said, uh, Jorge, I prayed for you. Yes, you did. And I was huge. And uh, I said, I want to share something with you. What's that? <laughs> How you can know for sure you're going to heaven? Well, I already know that. I'm Catholic. Okay. I needed boldness. For the next 45 to minutes to an hour, I talked to him, and he didn't get it. The Lord did give me boldness. You know, sometimes you have to just, I just tell people, I say, hey, if I'm going to cut straight with you, I'm going to tell you, if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to hell. And what you're trusting, I'm not being mean, but what you're trusting in is not the truth of the Bible. And so I've just, God gave me a boldness there, but still he didn't get it. And the Holy Spirit has to do all this, doesn't he? 
And so I'm praying, but he left. I gave him a New Testament. I, I gave him the tracks, and I said to Jorge, when you go home, just ask God, and I believe God answers this request, but you just ask God to show you the truth. We're in New York City with so many millions of people. I'm never going to see him again. The next day is our final day, and he came right at the end of his work about 4 o'clock, and we wrap up about 4.30-ish, 4.45 or so. In fact, they were waiting for me. I was the last one talking to him that day. I knew I'm never going to see him again because he works that late, and uh, tomorrow we're going to end at 1. And uh, so we're wrapping up the table and the chairs and getting all the tracks and everything together. And from across the subway hall, I hear, hey, Chris, <laughs> hey, Chris, Jorge, how you doing? And he comes over, you know, huge. I said, how you doing? And he shook his hand, ow. Oh. <laughs> I go, what are you doing off work? He said, oh, I got in a fight and they sent me home early. I said, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Good, lovely guy. <laughs> I said, did you read those things? Oh, I read a little bit. I didn't have a whole bunch of time. Okay. I said, hey, why don't you have a seat? Okay. And we sat and we talked with him. And I said, Jorge, look, you've got to see it's not works. Jesus did everything that is already needed for your salvation when he died on the cross. We simply trust him without any effort of your own. And finally he says, I see it. Yes, I will trust Christ alone. <laughs> He was saved. The power of the Holy Spirit, not only with the boldness on my behalf, but also in the understanding on his behalf. But then we need a power of the Holy Spirit for not only understanding a boldness to speak, but an effectiveness. That conviction, that working in that heart that's hard. The working in that heart, they think there's no way this one will trust Christ as Savior. John 7 and verse 37 says this, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. For out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. He's talking in an illustration of the Holy Spirit. He said, if you're thirsty, you come and drink. And then now out of you will flow. This is now the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to a believer to fill you to overflowing. Just like the Jordan River, every year the harvest waits for the Jordan, or I'm sorry, the Nile. The Nile to overflow its banks. As it overflows the banks, it gives that living water, and now the harvest is, is full, and it's wonderful, and it's abundant, it's plenteous. It's effective. Holy Spirit can do an effective work in and through you. When Peter preached in Acts 2, they were pricked in their hearts. They said, what must we do? Tell us. Just like that Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? The Holy Spirit's doing an effective work. What about that hard heart? That cold neighbor? The one on the mission field that you've been working for, working with and praying for. The one that's been coming every Sunday think, oh, if anyone can't get saved, it's this one. I had a neighbor like that. His name was Larry. His last name was Miller. No relationship at all. But um, I got to know him as a teenager growing up on the east side of Indianapolis. And uh, I would mow grass in yards in the neighborhood for work. So I mowed his yard and got to know him a little bit. I'd give him a track. I'd talk to him about Jesus. thinking, man, it's like talking to a piece of wood. Nothing's getting through. He was um, immediately he'd come home, and he'd open up the beer. He'd weekend, especially the six-pack or more, just live for pleasure, rough in his language, rough in his lifestyle. <laughs> so many, I can't even tell you some of the things, but I just thought, you know, if anyone can't get saved, it's my neighbor, Larry. <laughs> I'd ask him, did you read that track? Oh, yeah, yeah, I read it. I'd go through the different, you know, truths of the track, I'm like, he didn't read a th cotton-picking thing of it. <laughs> but every once in a while, he'd give me a call. And one time, he gave me a call. And he said, Chris, I said, do you need your yard mowed? No, no, no. Chris, I'm having an attack. What is it, a cardiac arrest, a heart attack? No, no, it's a Dairy Queen attack. Very dangerous. 
<laughs> incredibly intense. And so I got permission from my parents, and we went to Dairy Queen. And over ice cream, I talked to him about his soul and about heaven. But it's still, it was like talking to a piece of wood. Nothing's getting through. He moved away. And uh, I went off to Bible college. He didn't get saved. But months later, I received a, a letter, a three-page letter. I went into the uh, kitchen. I set the table. I set the return envelope on the table, and I went into the living room, and I sat down on the couch, and I began to read the three-page letter. Right away, I recognized he's using some clean words and vocabulary, in fact, some Christian terms. And I said, well, that's interesting. Kept reading and said, remember all those times that I talked to you, I mean, you talked to me about my soul or about heaven, and I acted as if it wasn't getting through. Well, it was. And because of you, today, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I didn't believe it. I went to the third page of that letter to see if Larry Miller really signed it. I ran back into the kitchen. And uh, I got the return envelope to see if Larry Miller really signed it. (laughs) I was saying, no, this this is impossible. This is the guy that can't get saved. And he got saved. A Baptist pastor down in Florida witnessed to him and gave him the gospel. And he trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. All those times I was just giving the gospel, giving the gospel, sowing and watering, sowing and watering. So many times we don't get to hear about Larry Miller's. You know, he started a church, uh, started going to church down there, and he's been the same church for almost 20 years now. He rode a, drove a van, pick up kids. One of them got saved, several got saved, but one of them got saved, became the youth pastor, now is off pastor in another church, all because my neighbor, who couldn't get saved, got saved. He shares his story on this DVD. Would you see tonight that the power of the gospel is available for us and the Holy Spirit's power to make it effective to convince that heart and that life is available. So let me ask tonight, are you full of faith? Are you full of power? How do you get this? How do you take the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's just like taking a drink out of this water bottle. You know, um, I need to open it up. I could have it sit here the whole time. I could talk about the water bottle. I could shape the water bottle. I could look at the water bottle. But Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Will you take tonight, the power of the Holy Spirit by faith, and simply, like they did in the book of Ask, Acts, ask for it. Ask, Holy Spirit, I know you're inside of me. I know you, I have all of you, but I'm not experiencing your power in my witness. Now, Lord, would you do that work in my life? If you're here tonight, and you're not experiencing that type of power of the Holy Spirit, would you come? And drink and ask by faith. Would you take what God is offering to you tonight? Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help. Would you please give it? Lord, work in our hearts and our lives and help us to simply and quickly just respond to you, Lord, I ask.